Greatness is found in pure hearts that love Jesus Christ. Welcome to our worship service this morning. Uh, obviously, you can tell we're in my office today, but Pastor Matt is down at the auditorium, and he's going to lead us in our first song. So I'll open us up in prayer, and then as soon as I'm done, we'll send you down to Pastor Matt for our first song. Then we'll bring you back up here to my office for the message today. Father, thank you for bringing us together and for your awesome healing we love you and we trust you, and today we worship you. Lord, we are scattered about, uh, scattered about, we're in our homes, but we are unified by the Holy Spirit and by the saving work of Jesus, and we love you for that, Father. May you be blessed this day in Jesus' name, amen. serving the Lord in front of you all. Uh, obviously, a heartfelt thank you from Cherry and I for all of your prayer support, your kindness for allowing us to rest during this time. Um, jokingly, I had said to Pastor Matt early on, and this is probably my personality, I don't like things hanging over my head. And maybe you're that way too, you just want to get something over with. And uh, jokingly, not sarcastically, but jokingly, I told Pastor Matt, I just want to get the virus over with. Just get it and get done with it. And, um, you know, the Lord has a way of humbling us, doesn't he? And I will tell you, if I could avoid this thing, I absolutely would. You definitely don't want COVID-19. I know some people, their case is fairly mild. Um, mine was pretty significant. I've had, I had a fever for 14 days and I'm still bouncing back. It's probably going to take... From what my doctor says, another month before I feel better. But I'm so thankful for all the amazing things that God did to provide for um, 
both Cherry and I and for our care during this entire time. And I know it's because many of you have faithfully prayed for us. And I just simply wanted to say thank you. And I would encourage you, keep praying for protection and safety for our assembly here. We were trying to follow uh, as, as many of the guidelines as we could within reason um, and had tried to keep things spaced out. And yet still, we had some people get sick at the church building. And so we want to continue to be careful. Um, in fact, you may be watching this and wondering, Pastor, when do we get to do in-person services? As soon as is safely possible to do so would be my first response. Um, we want to be together. I ache to be together. And yet uh, we want to make sure that we keep everybody safe. So when we do return for in-person services, we're going to start with them outside. And we won't return for in-person services until our flare-up here in the state of Michigan has finally come to an end. Uh, it sure seems to me, and I'm not an infectious disease specialist, but it sure seems to me whatever's going on in Michigan is highly, highly contagious right now. And so we're just going to space everybody out and worship from a distance. We know how to do that. And so we're just going to keep supplying worship services for you through a link until this flare up cools off. And then we'll be able to be together. We'll be doing outdoor services. I was really desperately hoping that we'd be able to do an outdoor service for Mother's Day. But obviously, you know, Mother's Day is coming up very quickly. And so maybe the best thing for us to do, even though we will uh, have something for Mother's Day, would be uh, to postpone it and do a, an in-person outdoor Mother's Day service a little bit later on in May. So you'll be praying for us for wisdom, for protection for the assembly, as well as continued healing. We still have some folks that are sick and uh, we want to keep praying for them and for God's blessing on their life. And so for now, that takes care of our announcements. I wanted to talk about what I'll be doing this morning with you all. Uh, I don't think that I have the strength or the energy for a full sermon, but that's a good thing because that forces me to do something a little bit different than maybe what I normally would be doing. Um, and I'd like to do a little bit more of a Sunday school style uh, message today as we sit here in my office together and go through the word together. And so if you have your Bibles, I want to start um, by introducing you to a thought in Revelation chapter 22. And then I'm going to go from Revelation 22, and we're going to spend our entire time together today in the book of Luke chapter number 14. But let's just start in Revelation chapter 22. I want to read for you this idea, this theme, and then I want to take you to Luke chapter 14 and verse by verse go through a really fascinating, uh, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. You're probably wondering if we were ever going to finish up the essential series. And I had told you before I got sick that I wanted to talk to you about what our future looked like. And so that's what this is all about today. I even asked you to consider hanging on and safeguarding some of your resources. Uh, maybe some of the stimulus money that you had gotten or money you were thinking about spending for summer. Maybe you remember I had asked you to safeguard some of that. Well, today I wanna to talk about why that is. Revelation chapter 22. Um, I, I want to show you, obviously, Revelation 22. If you look for chapter 23, you aren't going to find it because you are at the end of the Bible. And so for me, knowing that it's the end of the Bible, even if I don't know everything about the Bible, knowing these are the last verses, boy, this really has my attention. What are the very last things that God has to say? Well, if you look at verse, um, verse number 12 is a really good reminder. I'll throw this one in there for free. It's not the verse I want to look at, but if you look at verse 12, remember what Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. But know that the master is going to return and that his return is swift. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Jesus is all that matters. But we fast forward down to the verse that I want to show you, verse number 17, to introduce us to this last essential we will. We've looked at a lot of different essentials, but the last essential that I want to look at today is we will. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And hit, let him that is a thirst come. <clears throat> and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. I love that thought, come. I'd like to pray and then introduce you to the text we're going to be looking at together this morning. 
Father, as we open your word, here we are in this precious passage in Luke, studying the life of Jesus. Father, I pray for the Holy Spirit to open our eyes and our mind to the reality of your word so that it's as though we are there in that room with Jesus at that feast. And Lord, may his personality, the way that he does things and the way that he cares, change the way that we project and think about the future. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Luke chapter number 14. As you're turning there, I want you to consider that phrase, we will, and maybe it helps you to personalize it, we will, we, I want to talk uh, about the church family, but to help you personalize it a little more, maybe you want to say, I will. Let me ask you, uh, what are you going to do tomorrow? Say, I will be doing this, or I will be doing that, and the longer you live, the more you find yourself saying, I hope to do this, and I hope to do that. And so I'm not trying to trample on the reality that we can't control a lot of things. That's not what I'm suggesting when I say we will. I'm not saying these are the things that we're going to do. Remember, Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't don't take thought about tomorrow. Focus on today. And so we will really talk about what we're going to be doing, not just what we're currently doing. So what will we be doing? Um, And I'm not trying to trample on the fact that God gets to direct our steps I'm just trying to figure out what resolution the Father would have for me that gives me my compass heading. And so consider we will to be the compass heading, big picture stuff, not only for ministry, but for all of life. So what is it that I am going to point my nose toward? We will. I remember when um, when we were kids, um, my brother and I had gotten to spend a bunch of time with one of my cousins in the Upper Peninsula. <clears throat> and we went out into the woods and uh, we were squirrel hunting. And um, I don't know if there's a right way to do squirrel hunting, but I we figured out what the wrong way was that day. Um, the way that we did it is we just walked into the woods and we listened for them to start barking. And you know that or not, the squirrels will they'll make a barking sound when they get upset when they see you. And so we would just chase the barking sound. And we really weren't paying attention. And you do that around here, uh, down here, downstate. It's not a big deal. You'll find the edge of the woods. But up there, when you're in a thousand acres of state forest and you're on that little corner of private property and you're chasing one squirrel after another, you can end up, as we did, miles from home with no clue where we were going. And I remember when we were trying to go back, I was following my cousin and I told him as I was following him, hey, you're not walking in a straight line. And it was overcast. We couldn't see the sun and it was evening anyway. And he said, well, I can't tell what a straight line is. You decide. And so I tried walking and he said, you're not walking in a straight line. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, no, you're not. If you just simply try and walk a direction that you want to walk, good luck. You know, you're probably not gonna be able to do it. But the way that we ended up getting out of the woods was once we figured out what direction was which, we walked from one tree to the next tree to the next tree. And so we got to that tree and then we all decided what tree we were walking to next. And by doing that, we were able to keep our compass heading. What I want to do is out of Luke chapter 14, show you the heart of Jesus because that's what I want my compass to be. And it might sound nice When you say, oh, just have the heart of Jesus, follow that compass heading. Say, oh, that's really wonderful. I'm just going to follow the heart of Jesus. What is the heart of Jesus? And so I want to walk through Luke chapter 14, where he's interacting with these people around him at this feast and mine out the heart of Jesus and break it down in such a way that we can follow from one tree to the next and live the heart of Jesus Christ. So that by the end of this, we are saying we will. Luke chapter 14. Excuse me, I'm still coughing a lot. So bear with me. But last time I checked, no matter how good the definition is, and we are filming in high definition, I don't think that anything is still contagious. So thankfully. Luke chapter 14. (coughs) Let's start with verse number one. And again, I'll still give you some things to write down, but I really want to have more of a conversation around this passage than me standing up and preaching. Uh, Luke chapter 14, verse one. 
And uh, by the way, I'm going to break down the first seven verses very heavily for you. And then we'll pick up the story. But the first seven verses give us the historical context, which we really desperately need. So verse one, let's break it down. Um, Luke 14, one, and it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief priests to eat bread on the Sabbath day that they watched him. <clears throat> a couple things to point out. He's in the house of what scripture calls a, a chief Pharisee. We're not actually given this guy's name, but I'll remind you of someone else that was considered a chief Pharisee, and that was Nicodemus. And so this is one of those guys, a really important guy, one that people respected, whose opinion mattered, <clears throat> who is trying to figure out who Jesus is. And here's a question. Is this guy optimistic about Jesus or pessimistic? Well, I think we're going to find out as we dig into the passage a little deeper whether or not this guy is optimistic or pessimistic about the presence of Jesus there in Jerusalem. So first, he's a chief priest, similar to Nicodemus. Second thing we notice, it's on the Sabbath. You see that there? We skip the word bread, we go, it's on Sabbath. Um, so right away we're thinking, okay, this is a church day. But then you look at the, the word bread and we realize this isn't just a normal Saturday for worship. This is a feast, this is a feast day. So this is, this is one of those major celebrations that, um, that the Jews even to this day continue to celebrate. <coughs> and I want to point out that they make it really clear that they're eating bread. So you, you hear bread and you think, oh, it must not be much of a feast. Um, the reason why they ate bread on feast days was because no one was allowed to prepare any food. So whatever food they ate had to be cold. In scripture, Luke is going out of the way to say, hey, this was a religious experience that they were having together. They were worshiping God at this feast. And then the last phrase, they watched him. Now, what do you think that means? They watched him. Maybe it means they're just looking at him and they're happy that he's there. Maybe they're investigating him or maybe they're trying to catch him. Verse number two, behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. <clears throat> and I want to set this up for you. Don't think about the Bible in terms of 2021 America. It's just not the way things were done. So the way that things were done is they would use a major, and if you were a wealthy man like this guy probably was, he had a feast room or a large room in his home where he could put many people. And those folks would either sit in small concentric circles around small tables or in large tables, or just literally spread out all across the room. And although we don't know exactly what sitting they had, what sitting arrangement they had at this meal, they're all sitting down to eat. And so it's this big, huge, we're gonna eat all day and talk all day about God and about ourselves and about the people around us and about Rome and about Jerusalem and about the temple. We're talking about everything, and we're just going to have this awesome, amazing day all day long, and we're going to do this to honor God. So imagine you you step into this room, and you see the master is sitting there, and he's he's been invited in by the Pharisee. He's probably sitting right next to the Pharisee at the head table or close to it, and um, in the room is a guy with what Scripture calls dropsy. Now, you hear the word dropsy, and you start thinking, um, lame leg, something like that. But what dropsy is, is fluid retention with massive swelling. Usually dropsy, and this is the old fashioned term for dropsy. Uh, now we don't really use the term dropsy. If you're swelled up with water, maybe you've got bursitis on your knee and that has to be drained off. Um, but more than likely, uh, dropsy is a byproduct of heart failure. So because your heart is failing, water is building up in your system. This guy's dropsy was so bad that he was, it sounds like he was disfigured from it. In other words, you could tell just by looking at him that there was something wrong with him. Maybe his legs were just enormously swollen with water. Maybe it was his hands. Maybe his hands were, were puffy, filled with water. 
But just know that if you had dropsy, there was nothing that they could do for you because it was more than likely from heart failure. And with the things that they knew back then, there was nothing that they could do to help. And of course, if it's heart failure, there's not much you can do anyway, except get a, a heart transplant nowadays. So here's this guy, certain man that was before Jesus and he had the dropsy. Verse number three, Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and the Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? So think about it. They're all sitting and they're eating. Jesus looks and right in front of him is this guy. Now here's a question. Is this guy there because it's an open venue? Sometimes these Pharisees, these godly men to show how kind and generous they were, they'd open it up to the public and whoever got there and filled the house first was allowed to be a part of the guest, uh, the guest list. And so uh, maybe it wasn't an exclusive guest list. Maybe this guy came hoping Jesus would heal him. Maybe, maybe they invited this guy knowing that it would put Jesus on the spot. In fact, if you go back uh, to chapter number 13, there's an interaction with um, the, the rulers of um, the tabernacle that kind of give us uh, an idea uh, I think of what's really going on. So if you look at Luke chapter 13, verse 11, it says, Behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. So for 18 years, she had this illness and was bowed together and could in no wise lift herself up, lift up herself. She was like she was folded in half from whatever physical debilitation that she had. Maybe it was arthritis. Maybe it was an injury. Maybe it was old age. But for 18 years, this poor lady is so cranked up, she can't even walk. Verse number 12, and when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and he said unto her, woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. Is this awesome stuff? And he laid his hand on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. So you have this crumpled up woman. You know, have you ever seen someone with, with psoriatic arthritis in their hands and their, their fingers are all disfigured? Imagine Jesus reaches out and touches it and, and the fingers just all like relax and straighten right back out to normal. This was her entire body. And he reaches out and he touches her and he says, you're loosed from this. You, you don't have to be bound by this anymore. Just know that when we're suffering, God sees the effects of sin and it breaks his heart. He sees us as bound by our personal failures that were started in the garden. God doesn't delight in human suffering. And we really get that, we get that image with Jesus here. He reaches out, he touches her, you're loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hand on her. Immediately she was made straight. And she glorified God. Uh, verse 14, the ruler of the synagogue, uh, I said tabernacle before, I apologize, the synagogue. The ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. And he said to the people, there are six days in which men ought to work. In them, therefore, come and be healed. Not on the Sabbath. So he's not only upset at Jesus, but he rebukes the poor woman. How dare you want to be healed on the Sabbath? You could have been healed on Friday or Monday or Tuesday. Take your pick, but you leave Saturday alone. Saturday is God's day. How dare you expect to be healed and to benefit personally on the day of worship? And so then verse 15, listen to what Jesus says. The Lord then answered and said, thou hypocrite. Doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to the watering? And ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound low these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? In other words, you have more compassion for animals than you do people what's wrong with you. And we think about our society and our culture and we think that it somehow has gotten worse than it's ever been. But you guys listen. We have always, always been wrong in what we value since we went looking for wisdom in the garden. And, and man has valued things that are not treasures. Um, I remember hearing a story of a guy that got like 20 something years in prison. Uh, he was sentenced for 20 something years because he drove down 696 and he threw puppies out his car window. And they got ran over by vehicles because the guy didn't want to race these dogs. Someone got his license plate, turned him in, and the guy got, and I want to be careful, but I'm telling you, he got a lot of time in prison. And I remember we were living down in Roseville when that had happened. And I remember people being just really upset about that. Even hearing it probably makes you upset. 
And yet this is the same culture who will put a man away for decades for throwing puppies onto a freeway, but will kill infants with abortion and justify it as choice. You say, what is wrong with us? It's our nature. We don't value the things that God values. And so that becomes a part of this we will statement is what's valuable. Let's go back to Luke chapter 14 and pick up our reading. So Jesus asked them, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Now here's the question, was this a trap or not? They held their peace. Not because they didn't have an answer, but because they had laid a trap for Jesus and Jesus took the trap and laid it on them. Isn't that cool? Do you see it? Here, they had laid a trap. They had put this guy in front of Jesus. And if he's compassionate, he has to heal him. And if he does, he's doing it again. He's violating their, their cultural accepted, you know, protocols. And so he asked them instead, hey, should this guy be healed on the Sabbath or shouldn't he? They held their peace, not because they didn't have anything to say, but because the only way they could answer is with character, and they had none. Character is not something you can fake or manufacture when you need it. Character is something that's developed. And so they had to keep their mouth shut because they weren't able to answer and yet watch Jesus' character come out. And I hope as you see his character come out, it makes you ache to have character as well. Verse number five. Oh no, I'm sorry, verse number four. They held their peace. He took him. Jesus took him. Literally, that's physically. He literally grabbed the guy. And then he healed him. And then he let him go. Don't miss the healing because... This healing that occurs here in this passage is unlike any other. It doesn't occur anywhere else. Here you have this guy with swollen hands, swollen feet, swollen legs, whatever it is. Probably from heart failure, could have been from something else, maybe even cancer. And Jesus grabs hold of him. Maybe he even takes him off to the side and tells him that he's what he's going to do and then does it, holding on to this guy to show this is coming from me. It's my power and his faith that's accomplishing this. And the guys, just think about this. I'm not joking. His big, huge feet just shrink up into normal size feet. His big, huge, swollen, fat, disfigured hands that can't hardly break up the bread just start shrinking in front of everybody. This is what the passage means when it says that he took him and he healed him and then he let him go. He All that dropsy, gone, and then he lets him go. What an awesome passage. And then as soon as he does, verse 5, he answered them saying, which of you shall have an an ass or an ox fallen into a pit. And to clarify the pit, the word that's used pit is the same word for well. Um, and in the book of Revelation, when it uses this word, it's talking about a dry well. So imagine um, in the ground, they've dug out this spot for holding water, but the water table has gotten too low. It's a dry season. And so it's this deep, steep pit that's supposed to have water in it that you can draw water out of. Um, maybe even hollowed out of stone, out of out of bedrock, and um, there's nothing in it, and an animal falls in, and he says, if you had an animal fall inside that pit, will you not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? And it was, it, this wasn't even a question, like this is utterly acceptable. No one would even process like, oh no, this animal fell in there, should we get it out? You're allowed to get your animal out of the pit when this happens. And for Jesus, this is such a violation of the created order because here you would care about the animal because of what the animal does for you, but you don't care about people. This is such a stopping point for the master. And so he asks him, you'd help an animal, but you wouldn't help a person? What's wrong with you people? Uh, verse six, they could not answer him again to these things. They've got no answer. They just don't have the character that he has. So then in verse number seven, we transition. He put forth a parable. Um, if you're not sure what a parable is, just know this. A parable is instruction from Jesus, often in the form of a story that's veiled for the contemporary audience. In other words, he's going to give truth and they're not going to understand all of that truth. Well, the reason why we love parables so much is not just because there's maybe meaning that we don't understand, but because we know that it's been put there for us, not for them. He told them a story at a time when they weren't ready for it, but you and I are. 
So he put forth a parable to those which were bidden. And when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, so they came in and the word that's used is chief rooms because you can translate the word room in, in the Greek here in different ways, but it, it just means the word, the word means place. So if you're thinking, oh, there's all these tiny little rooms all around. No, there's places to sit and there's, there's places. And then there is the chief place to sit. So the word that's used here, although it's a completely correct word for the translation, it doesn't really give us the clear idea here. So <clears throat> think of the word place. So Jesus had noticed they all picked the, the best places. Uh, verse number eight, when thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room or the highest setting, the highest place, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he's going to talk about honor and humility, but um, I guess I just want to quickly point out maybe something that's a blind spot in your own life. Um, when you go to Meyer, do you look for the worst spot or the best spot? I have been with guys joking around where I've gotten such a good spot. I'll, I'll just joking around, uh, turn and take a picture of that spot. I remember doing that one or two times in the past. I did it once with my dad, just joking around. Like this spot is such a good spot because I don't ever normally get good spots. This is such a good spot that I'm going to stop and take a picture of this spot just to prove that I got this good of a spot. Just being goofy. Um, I remember Pastor Matt telling me a story about one time how he had gotten a pretty decent spot and he had decided to back his car in. And as he was backing in, a lady tried to steal that spot from him and literally hit his car and then yelled at him for it and said, you shouldn't have been backing up in this spot. Uh, have you ever seen people get angry in a parking lot over parking spots before? I love the guy that pulls up and, um, and you pull up at the same time. And so he puts his turn signal on and you're like, oh, he put on his signal. I should have thought to do that. Now he's gonna get it. It's elbows out when it comes to parking spots, isn't it? It's whatever's best for me. And I've even noticed here in the ministry sometimes that happens. When I was brought in for the internship, uh, there were four spots that were painted with yellow lines like this. And I noticed them right away, first time I went to church, and I wonder what that is. I didn't think anything of it, I went and parked off to the side. Well, I was told to come into the office Monday morning and to be there to unlock the building. <clears throat> be there before everybody else. When I pulled in, I saw those four spaces and I didn't even hesitate. And I'm really glad that I didn't uh, because when I was in Bible college, they had ingrained in us that you do not take the best spot. You just don't. So I pulled in, I saw those four spaces. I pulled out into the middle of the parking lot and parked there. When the pastor, my boss, called me into the office, he handed me a, a list of, of things that he had thought about that he wanted to instruct me on. No kidding, one of the first things on the list of the things that he wanted to talk through was where I was to park my vehicle. And on that number one was, don't ever take one of those spots. Those aren't for the interns. Those are for the pastors and the pastor's wives and uh, for their families, not the interns. And that's fine, didn't bother me none. I was in my 20s and walking wasn't a big deal. But I'll tell you what, I'd have been pretty embarrassed if he had pulled out that sheet of paper and I had taken his parking spot. If you look at what Jesus says, he says, when thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room or the highest place. As a more honorable man than thou be uh, bidden of him. Imagine you go to a wedding, you're like, man, this place, this seat looks like the best one. It's got more mints than any other spot. The, the cups aren't cheap. They're nice glass ones and all of those things. <clears throat> and so I want to use that spot. And then you find out that that's where the father of the bride was supposed to sit. Like, oh boy, you know? And he says, don't sit there. You're going to embarrass yourself. And he that bade thee um, and him come and say to thee, give this man place. And thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest spot, the lowest room, the lowest place. That when he that bade thee cometh, he may say to thee, friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. If you want honor, you'll never be able to manufacture it for yourself. And you cannot have honor without humility. Stop serving yourself. So we know where not to go. Now the question is, where should we go? What will we do? Let's keep reading. We pick up speed. 
Verse number 12, Then said he also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, <clears throat> lest they also bid thee again, and recompense be made thee. If you want to have a feast and do something good for other people, don't do something that's politically advantageous. Don't hold a feast because you're going to get something out of it. But when thou makest a feast, don't call all your friends that'll invite you and take care of you. But instead, invite the people that can't do this for themselves. He says, when, when you make a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. I wish we had time. I'm running out of energy and I've been going longer than I probably should. But just know that those are all people that can't do much for you. He says in verse 14, thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed as the resurrection of the just. In the middle of this really practical story, he reminds them that the kingdom of God is what matters. And so from this explanation, hey, when you're at the resurrection feast, you'll be glad that you didn't take care of yourself because then I'll take care of you. Verse number 15, when one of them that sat at meat heard him, uh, with him heard these things he said unto him blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of god man this is a nice feast but it'd be awesome to be a part of the feast in heaven and this sparks this awesome awesome story from jesus verse number 16 he said to them a certain man made a great supper and he bade many and he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden come for all things are now ready and they all with one consent began to make excuses. And the first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I got property up north. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with property up north, but you know, it's amazing how our possessions can take us away from ministry, isn't it? He says, I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I've, I gotta prove them. I mean, this is justifiable. Man, I just bought a new car and I need to check this thing out. Possessions, obligations, opportunities to make money. And uh, I pray thee have me excused. Uh, verse number 20, this one's pretty solid. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Maybe they're newlyweds. Either way, everyone seemed to have an excuse. And I'll tell you, that's ministry. And, and I'm not saying that they aren't legitimate excuses, but it just seems like there's always excuses when it comes to serving Jesus, always. And now you get to see from Jesus's perspective what it means when everyone says no. So that servant came, he showed his Lord these things, and the master of the house being angry. Does that surprise you? That Jesus was actually angry that these people didn't want to come to the feast. He said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets, the lanes, the city, and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. If the people that I love and want to come don't want me, then let's go find the people that are in need, because they will. What a beautiful picture of the gospel. If you want to reach lost people, you're going to reach people that are in need, not people that you think you need. I think sometimes we spend all of our time getting excited about the person that we think is a great resource. When what we don't understand is that God's bringing people into our life so that we are the resource, so that we're the blessing. So go find the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. The master of this feast who's laid out this awesome feast says, I don't need important people. I need humble people. I need people that'll be thankful. I'd rather have a thankful beggar than an ungrateful, perfect picture of society. Verse number 22. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men which are bidden shall taste of my supper. And the phrase that I want to lock in, which is the, the entire title of the message this morning, is found in verse number 22. Yet there is room after the servant has brought in all the poor and the, the maimed and all the people in town everyone he can find that's willing he comes back and what does he say there's room that is the gospel revelation chapter 22 what was it uh, verse number 17 i think come the spirit says come 
And the, the, the groom says, come. And anyone that is willing, come and drink of the spring of the water of life. Come, that's what the gospel is all about. Yet there is room. Really quick, I just wanted to give some practical application. When we say we will, I want to live a life that says this statement, yet there is room. This is going to be my theme. It has been my theme and will continue to be, yet there is room. Number one, from your life can you say, yet there is room? Do you live a life that invites people into the gospel? You say, I don't have time. Make time. You are not a victim of your circumstances. You are the product of your own choices. And the greatest product of your choices is your character. If you don't have time to be reaching lost people, change the way you're living because that's what the gospel is all about. Yet there is room. Change your life. Reorder your time. Lead your own personality. Some of you say, I just can't talk to other people. Well, then force yourself to. Because... The gospel is all about reaching lost people. And if you have a mouth, you have the ability to talk to somebody. What you may not know is that quiet personality that you have that you think is your greatest handicap might be the heart that can only reach the unreachable. It's the soft and tender heart. And so maybe you'd say, I don't have enough time. Change change your life. Make room in your life for lost people. You say, I don't have the right personality. I'm not outgoing. Be the master of your own personality. Force yourself to do things that are uncomfortable. I want to be the servant that says, yet there is still room. And I want to live a life that does. And if I can give you something really practical, if you want to live a life that says, yet there is still room for more people to come to Jesus, create accountability through prayer partnership. That is, if God lays someone on my heart that I want to reach, I can go and tell Pastor Matt, would you pray for that person? And now I have accountability between me and Pastor Matt to make sure that I'm still looking for that next person, yet there is room. Maybe you would say, I don't know anybody. Then find someone in the church and ask them to start praying about God giving you contacts, yet there is room. Three areas, yet there is room. Number one, in my life. Number two, in our ministry. I hope that the preaching is always focused on the cross, that someone can come to any service and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, that our Sunday school classes will be about reaching other people, that will hold special events that are not about having fun, but about showing people who Jesus is, where we can have an assembly that jumps at the chance to meet someone that may not know Jesus. Number one, our life. Number two, our ministry. And now number three, and this is where it gets really, really practical, although number one is really, really practical. And number two is really, really practical. Number three, our facility. And there's two, there's two things about our facility, the ones that we currently have. Keep what we have accurate to what the gospel is, which is beautiful, attractive, and life-saving. And that's how we should keep the facilities that we have. But secondly, and more importantly, and here's the question, does our building say to people, yet there is room? That has always been a problem for me. Since shortly after we got into our building and we filled it up, the message from our ministry is no longer, yet there is room, but instead it's, Well, we had room for 87 and whosoever came already came and we don't have any room for anybody else. So we're sorry, but you can't come. Or if you do come, you're going to have to sit up by the piano because there isn't any more room in this building. Am I thankful for what God has given us? Yes, it's the declaration that although we're only 13 years old, we have this rich heritage. That we have people that have been saved for decades in a building that was built over 100 years ago. Because we're a part of a church that was started 2,000 years ago. What a wonderful image of the gospel in that way. And yet my biggest problem with our building currently is that (coughs) it doesn't tell the lost people around us, come. And it doesn't say, yet there is room. And I am willing to make personal sacrifices both from our finances and our savings and from my salary for the last 13 years to do anything and everything that I possibly can to get into a new building, not to create a legacy for ourselves, but to put a billboard out there of what the gospel really is. Yet there is room. Over the next several weeks, we're going to start introducing you to some giving campaigns that we're going to be starting. And we want to have a launch event this summer where we give you a chance to commit to giving to the new building project so that we can go to financers and ask them to finance our building 
that as soon as COVID is over, we are celebrating in a new facility. And I believe that God can do this. He has begun to move resources around. I know and believe that God is going to do this. And I'm hoping that you'll have enough wisdom and vision and insight to jump on board and be a part of it before it's too late. And then you can't be a part of it. Why? Because we will. What will we do? We will reach the lost. We will show them who Jesus is. And I will love what Jesus loves the way that Jesus loves. Father, thank you for the message today, for the strength that you gave me to do it. Uh, really surprised myself at how much I was able to do and just grateful for our church family for this assembly. Pray that you'd protect us. We continue to seek your hand in healing. And as we think about the future of our ministry, Father, we submit to you and we'll stay faithful. And I'd rather be Peter being held back than Judas sneaking behind your back, living for myself. So Father, we trust you, we'll stay submitted to you, but we will be fervent until you return. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. In your precious name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us today.